This is Do School Better, a podcast for people who want to transform education. My name is Doris Corda, and for the past several years, I've been training educators. Listen to these episodes and hear about some of the extraordinary programs they've created. We call these pioneers the fire starters. See if you can get some ideas that you can implement yourself to change your own practice. In this episode, Doris speaks with Oliver Smith business and economics teacher at Singapore American School. Oliver discusses the depth of learning his students experienced while solving problems for real businesses in his entrepreneurship and AP economics courses. He also describes the liberation that comes from teaching students without an answer key. Hello, Oliver. Hi, Doris. So, Oliver, if you could start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and then what you're doing. Sure. Uh, so I'm a teacher at uh, Singapore American School, and I've been teaching there the last three years. Uh, this will be my fourth year there. Uh, before that, I was uh, teaching in, in public high schools here in Washington State for the, the previous 15 years. And uh, in general, I teach uh, business, AP economics, entrepreneurship, advanced economics, and I've taught a bit of math in the past as well. You know, Singapore American School, it's a, it's a large international school. We have about 1,200 students, and it uh, kind of feels very much like a high-achieving you know, school would be defined in the U.S. And, uh, you know, I think since I've, I've been here, the administration, the school has been dedicated to innovating and finding new ways to help our students uh, be even more competitive in today's kind of changing global economy. So, so yeah, I, that's kind of how we met, I suppose. Yes. And you teach, you teach high school, correct? Yeah, high school. So uh, right now I'm teaching uh, AP economics and uh, we have a new entrepreneurship class that we've been teaching the last two years. And then I also teach kind of a general business class uh, and a, an advanced economics class, which is based kind of on development economics. That's great. And a, a little more about the your student population. Yeah, it's, it's an English-speaking school. And like I said, it feels very much like an American school. Um, most of our students have some connection with the U.S., uh, but we do have kind of an international flavor as well. You know, I, I would say that you would probably find that 60 to maybe 75 percent of the students have spent a lot of time in the U.S., while the other the other portion of it have mainly lived overseas for the, their whole lives, but we don't have very many English as, as second language speakers, you know, things like that. But we have a population that's that's mainly kind of an American population, so expats in Singapore. Yeah. Okay. That's that's really helpful. So tell me why you came to the workshop and what you took out of that workshop, and and then what what you did with it. So I think like two years ago, I was tasked with putting together a new entrepreneurship course offering for our students. And, you know, initially kind of thought back to my previous experience in public school, and I taught the, the traditional business plan approach that I'd actually learned in business school myself as well. And I never really kind of thought that that might not be the best approach because who am I to kind of question PhDs who are on these textbooks and you know, so initially that was my plan, but then I started doing a bit more research and I, I ran into a lot of the, the lean launchpad stuff and yeah. and I found a workshop in California that was through, I think, an organization, organization called VentureWell and I ended up attending because that was kind of the best thing I think I could find and it turned out to be kind of mainly attended by professors from universities around the world who kind of wanted to emulate what Steve Blank was doing and, uh, you know, other professors at, at uh Stanford and Berkeley and mostly and, at graduate schools. Yeah, mostly graduate schools. But uh, you know, since many of my students actually apply to these schools, I'm like, oh, we can handle this. And uh, you know, kind of took a chance to try something a little bit different. And I, I saw the the potential, but we we definitely had some uh, some issues with the college approach that they were using. Like for instance, I found the the, the kids they were supposed to be coming in with a an idea of their own, and uh, quite honestly, most of the ideas were were terrible. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they yeah. were, we know, I know how that is. So, yeah. I think upon reflection, you know, like a lot of the kids would probably agree with that as well. You know, they were either too broad, sure. too narrow, too unrealistic. And, and most yeah. of them wouldn't stand up to, you know, the tools that we we're using, like the business model canvas and customer discovery interviews. And, yeah. And they were constantly pivoting or, or scrapping their product uh, projects altogether. And it just led to burnout. You know, I realized that this wasn't really the best model for my students. Yeah. So I think, again, I kind of stumbled upon the uh, workshop. I think I found it on Steve Blank's website, actually. There was a, an article that was written up about your program, and it, it, it sounded like this is what I should have actually gone to first. And, and I wish I would have found your program before I went to the... The graduate school professor, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. So, uh, you know, I'd say the kind of the biggest things that, that, that I took away from 
uh, your workshop. I think it was just, you know, liberating to sort of realize as a teacher, you know, I don't really have to have all the answers. And uh, it, it's kind of fun just to, to be a coach or a facilitator again, rather than, you know, a disseminator of information, I suppose. And I really learned that it was that to love telling students that I don't have the, the answers and, and also uh, answering questions with questions. And, you know, yep. it was really nice to do that. And I think also structurally, it really helped out my course as well by using the business problems initially to, to kind of teach these tools. Uh, it really helped the students kind of put in context what, you know, these aren't just abstract tools that you're posting on your wall and trying to fill in. But these were actual tools that, that you could use in, in a real life context with real people and real problems. You know, it was it turned out to be a, a really good experience for the kids. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think what you're saying is hugely important. And I don't think people really understand it until they've done it. There are a lot of entrepreneurship classes, K-12 classes even now, where the students start by coming up with their own idea and then going through a process to create a business plan or a business model or a pitch. And what I think is massively important what you're talking about is that you're giving the students to start a real problem that's unsolved of someone else, another business that's a real one, it's specific, it's not a teacher produced project, and it's not a student produced project. And it allows them, as you said, you know, they get to learn some of these, these skills and methods working on something that's tangible of someone else's before they get to a place where they have to have some foundational stuff before they can generate things out of thin air on their own. Exactly. You know, I think also, like the students that I have, and I'm, I'm sure they're not unlike students all over the place, but, you know, they're, they're great at playing the school game. You know, if you kind of show them what an A looks like, they, they can yep. completely reproduce it. And, and, and this wasn't really one of those kinds of classes where they could do that. You know, I couldn't show them what an A looked like because I didn't know what an A looked like necessarily, especially with relation to each one of these business problems. So, you know, that was something that I really appreciated uh, as well, and I took away from the workshop. I also like, you know, the, the fact that a positive outcome for the students could actually be a negative outcome, you know, for their idea. And, you know, that's kind of real life, right? Yeah, where, exactly. Uh, where not everything's going to work out, and uh, that's valuable to find that out and as quickly as you can, I suppose, right? That was another, another thing that I really took away. That's great. So then you taught this in this entrepreneurship class this year. Yeah. Tell mm -hmm. us... Tell us, give us an example of a business your students worked on and, and describe it a little and what they learned and what they did. Yeah, sure. So we had, we had two kind of very different problems. Um, we scaffolded the whole thing. So we started with a, what I thought was a relatively simple problem, but it turned out to be a fairly complex. Uh, we uh, met an entrepreneur in Singapore who was uh, trying to import single origin Guatemalan coffee into Singapore. And uh, while he'd had some success kind of B2B, where he was selling to businesses and just kind of bulk, and they didn't really care what the, the, the price was. He really wanted to uh, you know, increase his margins and sell to the general public, but he wasn't sure if he had a customer base or not in Singapore. You know, would anyone care about single origin Guatemalan coffee? And would they care? Yeah, would they care if it you know, came from a certain farm and a certain hillside in Guatemala? And that was kind of the question that my kids were, uh, tackled, and, and it was really interesting to see some of the things that they came up with. Perhaps uh, local Singaporeans, they didn't really care a whole lot about it. You know, they found out through interviewing that his only real uh, customer base would be kind of the expat community. So um, that was kind of an interesting problem. The second one that we, we worked on was a software, it was an app, a phone app. It was another young entrepreneur who was uh, trying to start an app where people could meet on their travels. It, it was not really like a dating app or anything, but just kind of people who were traveling on their own who wanted to meet up and go to social events or go to museums or whatever. Her problem was that, I guess the idea is like TripAdvisor where uh, there's a lot of user-generated data. Yeah. So her problem was, well, how, how do I get these initial adopters to keep coming back until we have like a critical mass of user-generated data? And uh, that was the problem that my students uh, worked on for the second problem. And, it, and again, completely different than the first one. Really and, uh, you know, completely different things to learn. And, you know, it led to, you know, d different thinking and different uh, solutions as well. So it, was, it, was, it worked out really well. Yeah. So tell either by talking in general or picking one or two students in particular, whatever's easiest for you. Tell us about the learning that happened uh, in the course of, of that course. You know, 
starting out, I, like I said, I think a lot of my students, when they first came to the class, they thought that it was going to be a class about writing reports on Elon Musk and Bill Gates, and, and they weren't really uh, understanding that they were going to be doing the entrepreneurship themselves. So, you know, I have some, some pushback, I would say, initially, oh, sure. where, yeah, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't really what, you know, what I was planning on doing, and, and I can't play my little game of school here. I actually have to go out and start thinking and, and solving problems. And uh, Yeah, they're not you know, happy I, about that at first. No, no. <laughs> no. I mean, there, there was actually a bit of anger, I would say. But And then there were also some kids who were kind of like, oh, this is great. I can actually get an A for effort now. You know, I, all I have to yeah, do is show exactly. effort. I don't have to do much, right? I can, no, this is no. cool. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I would say that it actually turned out to be, for almost all of the students, it was, it was a positive experience where they really – we're, we're finding some things that I had never even thought of, you know, as solutions. And uh, I had a couple of students, uh, one in particular that, that, you know, she didn't seem super engaged initially. All through the class, I was kind of, uh, you know, is she really getting anything out of this? But then when the class was over, she actually had started her own uh, business online where she was selling uh, swimsuits that she had sourced through Bali and uh, was selling and distributing all around the world. And she was using a lot of the, the, the tools and the learning and skills that we talked about in class. And she was actually learning, and I didn't really actually realize it, I suppose. Oh, that's uh, so interesting. Yeah, yeah. And as a teacher, I mean, you've been teaching for many years in a variety of settings and schools and with a variety of student populations and subject matters. What's, how was this different as a teacher and from the more traditional courses you've taught? And yeah. what's useful? You know, I think... You get like a sort of a safe zone as a teacher, right? And you, you don't really think uh, outside of the box sometimes until you get hit in the head with uh, something new. And, you know, I would say that in, in my opinion, this is, you know, if it's not the future of education, at least it's a part of, you know, kind of the future of how we are going to be educating our kids in the future, you know, where kids are, they're using all their facilities from uh, many different, you know, subject areas to, to solve a real problem. I mean, this is, this is what real life is, right? It's re real inquiry-based learning where, you know, you kind of give a kid a problem and then they, it leads them to uh, rich, higher-level questions of their own that they have to, to think about. You know, and I also think it signals a shift sort of in the traditional classroom setting as well where, uh, you know, have the kids getting out of the class and, and talking to people. And we also use, utilize the flipped classroom method as well where we had kids uh, – watch Steve Blank's uh, Udacity videos as, as part of the course, yeah. and, and they've come to class with that already in, in their toolbox. You no, know, I think, and I think with technology today, you can do that if, if you have access to, to the technology that allows the kids to get some of the work done outside of class. And I also think that it's, uh, it's okay not to have the answers as a teacher, and, and that's something that, like I said, I found really liberating where – I don't know if what the kids come up with is the right answer or not, but uh, with, with evidence that they produce, it's, it, it's definitely a better guess than we had starting out. You know, I think that, that's a, kind of a neat thing to think about as a teacher going forward here with not only my subject areas, but I'm sure also in, in other ones as well. Yeah. And did you do a project in your economics class as well, not, uh, similar to the entrepreneurship class? Yeah, so we tried out the uh, the business problem in the, the entrepreneurship class first. We liked it so much, you know, my, my partner teacher, he, he'd never been to one of these these workshops. He still hasn't, but he's, he's planning on it at some point. Um, but he liked it so much that he, this advanced economics class was his kind of to start out, but he, he uh, really wanted to incorporate the kind of the methods we were using in my entrepreneurship class in the advanced economics class. So we partnered up with some NGOs and uh, tried to do some social entrepreneurship problems. And the first one involved trying to get villagers in a, a small Cambodian community to not only purchase, but uh, use latrines. This was, you know, in an effort to try to raise the sanitation in, in their, their village and, and uh, er eradicate some of the, the, the health problems they've been having and, and then inevitably, hopefully, inc increase their economic standing as well. So... Wow. Was, so, uh, your, so this is in your advanced economics class. We must have required a ton of research. What are some of the things your students learned about working on that project? Well, most of these students were uh, students that we'd had in AP economics who had done really well, and, and they just really kind of wanted to follow their interest in economics a little bit further. And we really try to give them a, a bit more real life experience with economics, with AP economics you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a lot of just content and uh, a real traditional approach to, to education. So we want to give them an opportunity to, to use what they're learning in our class in, in the real world. And I would say that a lot of the kids, while they were also learning 
more about economics. They were also learning about how you study economics in the real world as well. I mean, they, they had to go out and try to figure out why were these villagers making decisions they were making? Uh, was it based on economics? Was it based on culture? Was, you know, and, and they were learning all kinds of things in addition to just the economics that we were trying to teach them as well. When in the course of the year did you do that project and any other projects in that class? Was that at the end of the year, toward the beginning? Yeah, so we're a semester school, so we have two semesters, and the first semester was the our entrepreneurship course. So that was our where, where we first tried the business problems, and, and again, they they went really well, considering it was our, our first effort. Yeah, uh, so the second semester was yeah, the second semester was uh, advanced economics, and we kind of had to scramble to get these these projects together. It was a little bit harder finding NGOs or uh, nonprofits that were willing to work with us um, in Singapore because, quite honestly, Singapore doesn't have a whole lot of economic uh, development issues. Yeah. So we, it's a different dynamic. You know, we didn't have kids necessarily going out and doing interviews as much as they were with the uh, the business problems in our entrepreneurship class. Yeah, they probably had to do, you know, a lot of online research, Skype interviews, like emails, that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it, it was a different dynamic. It was a little bit, I would say it was actually a little bit harder uh, as a teacher to kind of keep the kids going than it was uh, when you're sending the kids out and actually talking sure. to people and of course. You know, trying to figure out the insight they're getting from interviews and so on and so forth. Yeah. So Oliver, you've taught in a variety of schools and you've taught in public schools in the U.S. You're teaching in an international school with a very competitive sort of college competitive population of students and parents. You've been teaching subjects, AP classes, advanced classes, math, economics, the stuff that most consider to be pretty significant, academically challenging stuff at a high school level. If I gave you the choice between you could teach advanced economics, mathematics, all these things in only a traditional way or only using this new methodology you've been piloting, which would you do and why? And you can only do one, you can't do both. <laughs> uh, well, definitely the traditional approach would be easier, but I, I would definitely, I think, choose obviously the, the business problem approach or problem approach, I guess, because you know I think it's really important that students understand that they're going to be able to show that they can actually solve problems at some point in time. When, when, when they have that first interview with a, a college or an employer, they can say, look, I've actually done something. Uh, I've tackled a real problem and I found solutions. What, whether they're correct or not, I, I don't necessarily know, but I've, I found evidence to support these solutions and, and perhaps, you know, even, you know, solutions that could be valid in, in a, a real world setting. So, uh, these are skills I think that are that are really important. They go above and beyond what you're gonna you know find in a traditional classroom where where students are memorizing textbooks and uh, filling out multiple choice tests and things like that. So to answer your question, absolutely, I would I would take this real world uh, problems based approach. And do you consider the learning academic that they're doing? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, some of the the projects that students were coming up with at the end, or some of their their, their presentations, uh, blew us away. I mean, absolutely blew us away. I mean, they were going above and beyond what was expected. And actually, you know, I, I it was tough in in some cases for myself and my my partner teacher to to keep up with what they were doing. If you were to show some of the, these these projects to you know administration or whatever. Uh, they, they, I mean, well, we did actually, we had administration there and they, they were, they were blown away by what our kids were doing academically and, and, uh, also again, just kind of practically. So just out of curiosity, tell us some examples of the kinds of things that they were addressing in these presentations. I think, I think for people who haven't experienced this, it's really hard to wrap your head around the fact that this, these students end up gaining deep knowledge of really, really rigorous academic content in the course of doing this kind of work. People think of it as one or the other. Be great to hear some examples of, do, do you remember some of the kinds of things they presented? Yeah, I mean, th there were some uh, where, where students were, were really kind of, you know, I, I'm thinking back to our advanced economics class where we have some, some really amazing students and they would kind of go above and beyond what we taught them in economics and, and come up with you know, some of the models that we, we hadn't taught them before and they would actually figure these models out on their own and, uh, you know, kind of, use those in their presentations where we definitely didn't expect that. 
And then also just yeah. kind of some simpler solutions that were maybe not quite as obvious. Like, for instance, when, when we were working on the project uh, in Cambodia, uh, you know, some students were looked at looked at some cultural uh, behavioral kinds of solutions that weren't necessarily obvious, and the kids had to do a lot of research to to find the, you know the, these out, and also uh, they had to have evidence to support that these solutions you know perhaps worked someplace else before, or they were tried someplace else, and and uh, that they might work in this context as well. Yeah, I mean, what happens in a project like that, even if it lives in the advanced economics course, and even if they end up with a lot of their work rooted in economics and the application of models, et cetera. It's not a single discipline what you have to work within when you're solving a problem like that. You have to look at behaviors. You have to look at culture. You have to under consider all that other stuff, uh, which is what happens when you get out of school and you're doing anything <laughs> that's not in a discipline defined classroom, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. There isn't a textbook to to solve life's problems for sure. So I mean you, you absolutely yeah, have no. to kind of go outside of the, the, the context of what you're you're learning in in class and, and sometimes use other skills as well. So And so did you I'm also interested in in both of your advanced economics entrepreneurship, did you see what kind of re result did you see from having them work on teams? What kind of was there a benefit to that, did, to the learning that came from that? Did it not matter? Well, <laughs> this is funny because as, as a teacher, this was probably our, our uh, this was the biggest stumbling block for us when it came to using this method because we have a, a couple of, well, I don't know about unique things. I'm sure that, that there are policies like this in other schools, but we're not necessarily allowed to uh, grade, uh, you know, using group grades or at least, you yeah. know, a, a, yeah. a large portion of the grade can't be based on a, a group grade. So, by the uh, way, same here. Same yeah. Here. I had to figure out how to give grades with this model in a school where people, kids get individual grades. Absolutely, yeah. And it's uh, grades in our school are very important for the students. I mean, they're very aware yeah. of their grades at all times. And uh, yep. it, it, it's something that we have to wrestle with, you know, where, um, you know, I think a lot of the students, they would tell you, you know, that they're very interested in, in this learning and this real life application. At the same time, the grades were important. So when we put them yeah. in groups, we had, you know, there was kind of a definitely a learning curve for us to try to figure out how we were going to assess students. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, that took us a while to, to kind of get going. I think we have a, a grasp on that now. But um, I think obviously working in groups is, is, is a good thing for the kids. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at it from the teacher's point of view. But um, I think the kids really... You know, they, they did a great job of communicating with each other, uh, learning from each other, helping each other look at things in different ways. And, and uh, you know, I would love to do more group work uh, than I do already in my classes. Yeah, it's it's that. Yeah, you're right. It's on the teaching side that you have to do contortions to fit it into a graded system. And that's right. where a lot of the the work to, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I give teachers methods of assessment that can fit into a graded system. And on the other hand, I'm, I'm working on the, you know, Mastery Transcript Consortium Board to try to create a new transcript as an alternative to grades, because I, I don't think, I don't think ultimately grades serve the purpose they're intended to serve. And I think that they're, they're actually doing the opposite. But I think the kind of learning that happens when students do this challenging stuff on teams is super valuable to the rest of their lives as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you've done this one year and I really, I really applaud you for your bravery. It's really hard work and it's really, it's risky. It feels risky oh, absolutely. to be, yeah, to be in a, a, you know, a high school teacher in a really competitive school doing this. It's risky from a lot of different angles and really crazy hard to be the, the pioneer in this. So coming out of this year, are you doing it again? What does this mean for your, for your school, for your community? You know, are you, are you going to get driven out of town? Are you in the U S <laughs> because they, they said, get the heck out of, out of Singapore. What's next? What's oh gosh. Next? I hope so. Um, yeah, no, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're absolutely doing this again. Um, no, we felt like it was a, a, a success. I mean, it was, it was, there were definitely stumbling blocks. Um, but that's learning for us as well. I mean, we kind of have to learn along with the students and, uh, Again, you know, not every business 
problem or, or problem in, in economics is going to be the same. There, there could be uh, situations where we have to scrap it all together and be ready to do that. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we have the trust of our uh, administration to do this, and so we feel confident that uh, we can take this risk and it's not, uh, you know, get, get us fired or anything like that. So, um, no, we're absolutely going to continue with this work and try to find more more interesting and rich problems that we can have our students work on. And it's obviously a lot of work, but uh, we're, we're, we're totally up for it and uh, super excited about you know, kind of seeing where this goes from here. That's great. Do the students coming out of your classes, would they say now that they've been through the whole thing, would they say, yeah, that was good. I'm glad we did this weird class this way. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, just looking at the numbers we have uh, signed up for next year, we have double the number of kids uh, that, that we had this year. So um, I, I, think word, I think word, word is spread that uh, it's really a class that's different from other classes. And it's uh, a class where you can kind of go out and, and – uh, you know, learn a lot of different things using a lot of different skill sets. And, uh, you know, it's just something that I think kids really understand that there, there's value to that. And, and in addition to what they're learning in, in tradi- the traditional classroom setting. That's fantastic. And do you, you said your teaching partner wants to do this as well, continue teaching this way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, like I said, I think he's, uh, he's also going to be coming to one of your workshops here. Gotcha. Uh, soon, I'll so. be li- yeah, I'll be. You'll have to send me all the dirt on him before. Sure, so sure. I can, okay. Oh, there's, yeah, there's sure. lots, lots and lots of dirt. Okay, that's awesome. That's great. Well, Oliver, I'm so excited to hear what you've done in just your first year. The first year, the pilot is by far the hardest. It's usually pretty gruesome, and I'm sure it was very hard for you. But uh, you've come out of it. The fact that you have twice as many kids signing up the next year says it all. And I'll be really excited to hear how your next year goes. Let's talk again in a year. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks for having me Thanks, Oliver. Appreciate it. If you like the podcast, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. For more information about our training, go to wildfire-education.org.